It's been said that our culture can be characterized as one of narcissism, an age of entitlement. We might have heard that term narcissism before. It comes from an ancient Greek legend about a boy named Narcissus who was very, very handsome. So handsome that it was thought the best thing is that he not be able to see his reflection until he matured later in life. So his mother took out of the house all the shiny metal objects and things that would show Narcissus a reflection. One day Narcissus was out in the field and saw a pool of water, looked down and saw his reflection in the water and immediately became so enamored with himself that he reached down to embrace this image and he drowned. Narcissism. Now, we've probably used that to refer to somebody else because, of course, we're never narcissistic. But we live in a society that is, in fact, quite narcissistic. If we look at all of the social media and our devices and the apps that we use, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all kinds of different things in which we use to promote ourselves and get ourselves out there to be noticed. If we put videos up, on YouTube, we want to see how many likes and how many views we're getting. We even have a term now called a selfie, where we take lots of pictures of ourselves to share with other people. So it is, in very much certain, certain terms, a narcissistic culture. This isolates us and gets us focusing only on ourselves making sure that we have a spotlight following us wherever we go. And this desire to be absorbed by ourselves is nothing new. This happened to James and John when they went to Jesus and said, Lord, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. What would you like me to do for you? We want to sit at your right and your left when you're on your throne in glory. They want to share in Jesus' power, but they don't understand what that power is. The kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom that is shown forth by wealth and power like all the other earthly kings. James and John had a wrong idea of leadership in their minds at that time. They wanted this authority for themselves. They wanted it for how it would benefit themselves. And so the other ten aren't so much better off because then they all start arguing with each other about who's the greatest and why they put themselves forward. So Jesus, in his loving kindness, used this as a moment to teach all of them. If you wish to follow me, if you wish to be my disciple, then you must be a servant. He says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus uses service in the same sentence as to give one's life away. Jesus joins service to sacrifice, and real service is inseparable with that of sacrifice, which is why we have a hard time serving others. And if we do enjoy serving others or certain groups of people in our lives, it's likely because we feel rewarded or we feel like it's making a difference. There's some reward attached to it. The true service of Christ is to give your life over regardless of the response of others. And in our world, there can be two ways of looking at life. I'm here so that others can serve me or I'm here so that I can serve others. And if we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to be in service of our brothers and sisters, to give our lives for one another in sacrifice. Service costs us. It costs us time. It costs us generosity with our wealth and resources. Service costs us patience. Service is always demanding. 
but it is the true way to happiness and the true way to being a disciple of Jesus. And in fact, the only way to be a disciple of Jesus is to model our lives on his. And one particular holy young man who lived this way is a good witness to us today is a man by the name of Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. Pier Giorgio Frassati. He was born in 1901 in Turin, Italy, to his parents, who neither one very pious as Catholics at the time. And Pier Giorgio lived his life in a hidden way, serving others. Much of what he did wasn't even clear until after he had died. Pier Giorgio, to his family and neighbors, was just an ordinary guy who was athletic and outgoing and not particularly studious. And he had many close friends and loved to go on outings and go mountain climbing and hiking. He had a great sense of humor and loved to play pranks on his friends. He took particular enjoyment in annoying his father. His father was the owner of a progressive Italian newspaper called La Stampa. His mother was an artist, neither one being particularly pious. His father, in fact, had drifted away from the faith and had become agnostic. Pier Giorgio, in his life, in loving our Lord, lived to have the time to enjoy himself with his friends, but always making sure that he gave himself to Christ. Even on his, his hiking trips and trips to the mountains with his friends, he made sure that he'd schedule it so he had time to go to Mass each day in the morning. Pier Giorgio's parents were consumed by the activities of their own lives and had little awareness of Pier Giorgio's heart and mind being transformed through the love of Jesus. Pier Giorgio began to build a habit to visit and befriend the poor of Turin, those who were unemployed, those who were downtrodden. He always sought to seek their needs and run their errands always doing things for others. And most of his friends had no idea what he was doing, but he was often known for giving away his coats and his shoes and his jackets and clothing, and his father was always having to replenish his closet, not sure where all his clothing is going. His dad, being well off, would often make sure that he always had, his son always had a first-class train ticket when he traveled. And Pier Giorgio would go and exchange the first class ticket for a third class ticket and then use the remaining money to serve the poor. He would run errands, get them clothes, get them medicine, whatever they needed. Pier Giorgio was suddenly struck with polio, never complained and suffered in quiet. And by the time his parents realized that he was really ill, it was too late. And on July 4th, 1925, Pier Giorgio died of polio at the age of 24. And it was what happened after his death at the funeral that people began to see immediately just what a holy young man Pier Giorgio was. Because besides from his father, who was very well connected, and his friends and the elite of Turin coming to pay their respects for the family, there were also many hundreds of others coming who were those of the unemployed, those from the streets, those who were poor, came to pay their love to Pier Giorgio, this young man who loved them all so much. The witness of Pier Giorgio's holiness immediately impacted his parents, who before Pier Giorgio died had decided to separate, for their marriage was in the shambles. But after Pier Giorgio's death, they recommitted themselves and reconciled to each other, committed themselves to live out their married life, and Pier Giorgio's father returned to his, an avid practice of his Catholic faith, and when he died in 1961, received all the church's sacraments. Pier Giorgio was one who lived to serve. He served all those that he could, and he did it in a hidden way, in a joyful way. No spotlight, no acknowledgement. Pier Giorgio challenges us then to see, are we really living the servant lifestyle? Do we live in such a way as Jesus says to his apostles 
in the Gospel of Luke later, I am among you as one who serves. I am among you as one who serves. Do we look at our children? Do children look at their parents? Do we look at our spouses, our family, our friends, those we meet every day at work? Do we look at them in our hearts and say, I am among you as one who serves? Do we really want to serve and make life better for other people at the expense of our own comfort, our own enjoyment, what we would like to have happen? Do we really sacrifice ourselves? There's really two ways of living in this world. It's to live thinking that we are to be served or to live to serve. If we live to be served, then we walk around with this narcissistic attitude. Everything I do is based upon what's in it for me. And when I do anything, I expect rewards, acknowledgement. I expect to be thanked and want to be thanked. I expect that my life as a Christian ought to be easy, pleasant, and enjoyable. I avoid sacrifice, discomfort. I want to live my life with ease, without sacrifice. I turn to God like James and John. God's got to do something for me. Bail me out. Give me therapeutic comfort when my life gets difficult. Or we can live to serve in the model of Jesus, which means to give ourselves, not begrudgingly, but joyfully in the service of others to carry the cross of what comes when we have to serve and be with and help out any other human person in our lives, to expect the challenges of daily life, to understand that we are responsible for one another, especially those whom we're sent to serve in our vocations. If we look at our home life, do we live a life as those to serve? Do we serve our spouses? Do we help each other out? doing all the mundane tasks and chores of daily life, the undesirable things we'd like to set aside and ignore? Do we leave all those for someone else to do in the home? We come home from work exhausted and tired. What's our attitude? Are we still there to serve? Are we there to be served? For us ordained in ministry, we live and lay our lives down to serve those in our parish, those in our church, with the rest of our lives to serve them. In the workplace, do we help colleagues out, especially the colleagues that bother us and annoy us? Do we spend time listening to people who want to speak, who just need a listening ear? When we know interiorly we're impatient and need to get on with our day, will we stop and really be present to them? And then in our parish. So oftentimes, the Catholic Church in America, especially the Experience of the Catholic Church in America at the local parish level can often be a one-way street. Everybody comes to church to be served. Everything has to be ready, prepared, as we like it. But do we understand that all of us, from priests to all the lay faithful, each of us is sent here by God also to serve? What am I giving over? What am I giving of myself to the mission of the parish? Does Christ really matter to me enough to sacrifice myself for the good of the church, for her mission? Do I take responsibility for being a member of my local parish? As we prepare in the next few weeks to celebrate our Commitment Sunday, which is known as our Discipleship Sunday on the 31st of October, you'll be receiving a letter from me, as I said last week, to get us to prayerfully consider the ways in which We're asked to commit and recommit our lives to Christ as disciples through dedicated worship, through engagement at the parish level, and through our heroic and generous giving. Jesus is calling all of us to be his disciples, and it costs us our lives. Last week, it was the rich young man being invited to give up his wealth and possessions to follow Jesus. This week, we're being asked to give up our comfort, the way we'd like to have things so in our lives and to leave our lives in service, to serve Christ to serve through serving our neighbor. Pierre Giorgio stands in his example for us today. His witness has drawn many back to the faith. 
has drawn many to understand that even this young layman who wasn't married, not ordained a priest, simply lived to serve others. The power of the witness of service converts lives. Today we are so blessed to have Eric Wanger here in our parish with his family. The Wangers have been members here for many years. Liliana and Eric have been married for 28 years, and Eric is finally joining the fullness of the faith today through confirmation. And it's really through the witness of his wife and his children, and certainly through friendship with so many of you, that Eric has seen and heard the Lord calling him home to make this this total commitment of his life to the church through this parish. But also, in doing so, he's recommitting himself to his role as husband and father. And so today, this day where we are being invited to serve, to be the people who are here to serve Christ, how is that always happening? We lay our lives down for one another as Jesus did and does for us. And through the intercession of Pier Giorgio, may we all have this heart of Christ, this servant heart to joyfully give of ourselves to one another without counting the cost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. 